So it's um, this is the third session talking about uh, eclipse planning for Novak members. Uh, this is the March meeting, and I'd like to welcome everybody. Uh, I've got a, a slide deck, and I hope this will become a discussion with people who have done observ observing before, uh, or also uh, people who have specific questions as we go through. Okay, so the topic tonight will be the visual observation of a of a total solar eclipse, and uh, I do this from an experienced background of seeing well maybe three, and still being so excited I don't quite remember what I saw, but uh, we'll still work on it. Uh, keep on doing doing it until I get it right. So what we're going to talk about tonight is what you can expect to see in the sky, uh, what you can see in your surroundings, some ideas about the viewing equipment, which is thankfully quite simple for, uh, for visual observing, and a little bit about choosing the site, which is also a fairly obvious kind of information, similar to the things we talked about before. So what you're gonna see in the sky in a total solar eclipse is uh, the partial phases, Bailey's beads, flash spectrum a bit, depending on how you observe it and if you're lucky, and then the corona during totality. Um, <clears throat> don't want to fully eliminate the uh, ob observation of the coming um, annular eclipse. Annular eclipse is sort of like the partial phases, um, or it will be the partial phases, uh, if you're not on the central line, it's exactly the same as a total solar eclipse because you're not going to see the central portion. Um, but during a uh, an annular eclipse, when the moon is directly lined up with the sun, you see a ring and you don't see the corona. Uh, this is a good composite of what's happening. And you have to put this in the context of the sun moving over a period of about two hours from beginning to end, from what's called first contact to third, fourth contact, uh, when the moon first impinges on the sun uh, like this. Can you see my pointer? Yes. Oh. Is that Linda's image, by the way? What's that? Is that Linda's image? No, this is one I actually pulled from uh, National Park Service. It's a composite. Um, yeah, I, I, I think Linda built one like this. I, I am just remembering it. Yeah, one of the cool. uh, one of the difficulties, and, and it's more a topic for the photography, because it takes two hours, the um, the total motion of the composite of, of the composite uh, is thirty degrees, so you wouldn't get one horizon. It would be blurred if you did some tracking. So this is individual images put together. But oh, yeah, uh, this, I realize that. this is indicative of first contact. And as time goes on, the moon is covering more and more, obviously, until it leaves just a, a thin, thin sliver, uh, which becomes a little bit more important when you start thinking about and, and talking about what happens on the ground. Um, it gets almost totally covered. We'll talk about this in Bailey's Beads, totality. And then on the other side, the moon moves away. So as I said, it's about an hour between first contact and second contact, which is the beginning of totality. Uh, and it's about an hour from second, a third contact to fourth contact when it moves totally out of the way. The, um, in an annual eclipse, things are pretty much the same, except in the middle here, you don't see the corona. You see a ring of sunlight uh, more or less concentric with the moon, depending on how close you how close you are to the to the middle of the of the center line. Uh, if it's a very large uh, moon with respect to the sun, but still fractional, you may see a prominence. I think the eclipse this year uh, is not so close, so I don't think people would expect to see prominences. Um, I don't think uh, there's you just. Know, to... Sorry, yeah, just right. going to ask a question. It's it's like a, a spectator question. Uh, how much does the 
proximity of the moon have to do with it rather than the proximity of the earth to the sun? Because those are the two variables that have to do with the right. angularity. Uh, I believe that the moon changes relatively more than the sun changes. That is the eccentricity of the moon's orbit is greater than the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit around the sun. So that the uh, whether it's an annular eclipse or a total eclipse will be dominated by where the moon is at the time of the eclipse with respect to its perigee. When the moon is so, close so to lunar, the Earth, lunar apogee, apogee is more important than Earth apogee. Um, yes. When, well, when the moon's far away, it's small. When the Earth is far from the sun, the sun is small, so you're going to get a longer eclipse. Fred Espinach's book talks quite a bit about the mechanics of the alignment of um, where the moon crosses the ecliptic um, and and the relative phasing of the moon being close to the earth and large enough to cover the sun and conversely the earth being far enough from the sun so it's easy for the moon to to cover it i believe the the result is that you actually get more annular eclipses and total eclipses uh, but they tend to be less less observed and also i believe because the Earth, uh, where you're seeing it from the Earth, has a some effect too. Annual eclipses are more likely to be near the poles. Uh, I, I'm not sure on that recollection, but you can look it up in, in as I said, in Espinach's book. Um, uh, I'm I sorry. Go ahead. No, I'm just. Uh, can you put a link to that book? I don't know that book. Um, you know yeah, I, in I, our library. I think I did it. Um, I picked it up. Actually, I picked up the version of the book, which he did uh, before 2017, because not much has changed except the details, but the, his background stuff is the same. Um, uh, the book is entitled Totality, uh, and it's Espinac and two other authors. Can you spell the last name? E-S-P-A-N-A-K. Okay, thank you. And he was the uh, he was the go to guy. He he goes around and gives talks as Mister as Mister Eclipse, but he was at Goddard, and um, he was their orbital dynamicist and did a lot of calculations for how NASA could observe eclipses. And now Thank he's you. retired and, and just uh, lectures on it. And Dan's showing a, a picture or showing the the uh, book in his screen. Dan Ward is. Okay. Thank you, Dan. I, I can't. Thank do you. This. All right. So the, the next topic uh, that I want to talk about, which is where you get into the interesting parts of a total eclipse, uh, is the Bailey's beads of the diamond ring effect. Uh, and that is caused by the hills and valleys on the moon having uh, producing a non circular edge to the moon while the sun itself is is very close to being a perfect circle, slightly oblate like the earth because it's spinning. Uh, so the moon, so the, um, the sun's a little bit wider at the equator than it is at the bowl. Uh, the moon is quite round except for the hills and valleys. And as the moon begins to cover the total uh, disk of the sun, raw sunlight continues to flow through the valleys. And depending on exactly where you are with respect to the center line, uh, these will appear either relatively north or relatively south. This, of course, is a composite that shows a time series uh, as the moon, in this case, moved in. So initially, there was a fairly wide region that was still showing up. But as the moon moved in closer, the, the bright areas got more uh, reduced and isolated. And, uh, and then on, on the other side, you get 
the valleys from the other side of the moon. It depends exactly on the libration of the moon. It depends on where you are with respect to the central line, uh, a couple of other factors, but it can be quite pretty. And it's easily observable because you're still observing uh, direct sunlight. And this is the point where you know you can take your sunglasses with your solar glasses off because uh, you're not going to get you're not going to get damaged at all by the sunlight. Alan? Yes. So that should be predictable, right? Uh, yes. In theory, in theory, it is. I don't know if anybody does it. Oh, really? Okay. Um, it's a lot. Some of the other variables uh, include. Uh, again, the how close to totality it is, uh, as opposed to annular. Uh, so you have that range, and that affects how much of the sun, uh, you know, like uh, if a tiny bit of the sun gets shown at the very last, then you get a narrower. Uh, well, we can see sort of a cone going in toward the dark moon, and then a cone of light coming out to the to the as it as it leaves, uh, that that cone would be wider if uh, the eclipse is more exactly total rather than super total. Right, and and the moon can be uh, um, again. I don't remember the exact number, but let's say the moon can be five percent larger than the sun. In in a long eclipse, the moon will be quite a bit larger than the sun. In a short eclipse it'll be just barely larger than the sun. Um, you'll have a narrow uh, path of totality because if you move uh, very far north or south, the moon won't be covering the north or south pole of the, of the sun. Um, but I think mainly getting back to what, I think what it was Sue who was asking, if you, if you generated a silhouette of the moon, for that instant, and taking into consideration the libration, you could measure exactly which are the deepest valleys that um, would let the sunlight through the longest. Depending on the magnitude of the eclipse, that may occur relatively earlier or later, but it'll occur at the same place. So you really could map these out. Uh, but you'd have to then take the silhouette that you'd calculated and slide it north-south to correspond to how far you were from the center line, either north or south. And that we, might have a small... Yeah, we used, to, we used to do a bunch of that stuff when we did occultations many years ago. Right, and that's one of the purposes of occultations, precise timing, to understand when a star was going to disappear, either at a mountaintop or a valley, and to get a precise measure of the height of that by timing the difference uh, from different um, positions on the earth, north and south. In effect, an occultation is, is an eclipse of a star. Uh, so the, the same techniques hold. And David Dunham has advocated that people hang out near the southern or northern edge of the path of totality to help with timing experiments, uh, timing measurements that help people uh, improve our knowledge of the orbit of the moon. Now, I'm not sure if that has, uh, if that has been totally replaced by laser measurements. I suspect it has, uh, but there's still some ambiguities that can be erased by knowing exactly the timing of um, disappearance and reappearance as a function of position on the earth. I would also presume that there are changes in the uh, celestial geometry that uh, continue to make fluctuations in any timer timing uh, reports that we might have made 20 years ago. They'd be different now. Well, but that's what the laser ranging, uh, the laser ranging does most of that. Um, but uh, you're right. It can't tell if there's been cross plane motion very well. That's harder to do. Um, but people are pretty good about knowing where the moon is now. When you think about uh, uh, the fact that the satellites get within 
uh, the satellites launch to the moon get there within a matter of feet of predicted location, even when they're in orbit around the moon. So what, what used to be called lunar theory is pretty well solved by the, by the laser ranging. Okay, let me move on. Um, th there's a hint of the flash spectrum here or what causes the flash spectrum. But what you're seeing here, along with the, the uh, Bailey's beads, the diamond ring effect, is you're seeing the edge of the moon actually covering the bright disk of the sun, but revealing the thin area of hydrogen emission called the chromosphere. And if you have a grating, either looking with an eyeball or more likely with a camera, uh, and this is also a composite of two, but uh, one side was was captured on the on the top half, and the other uh, the other side, the emission uh, leaving was captured on the bottom half. If you put a, a, a grating in front of your eye or in front of a camera, what you get is the spectral lines of hydrogen, and you get a little bit of uh, sodium, and I think this is calcium in here. Uh, this is also hydrogen, but the, the same spectral lines that you see with an H-alpha solar telescope will become directly visible just before totality because the, the hot photosphere, which is producing broadband white light, is covered. And what you see is the thin chromosphere, which is only emitting in narrow bands of mostly hydrogen, uh, H-alpha. Does that make sense to people? And if you don't have this, if you don't have the grading, you will see the reddish pink H-alpha color. Uh, it's not pure red because it's mixed in with these others, but the strongest emission line is H-alpha, and that'll be visible naked eye uh, in the same way that the uh, planetary nebulae emit in narrow land, uh, lines. And again, this photograph, the top half was taken during ingress and the bottom half was taken during egress. They just put them together for cosmetic purposes. Are you saying that uh, somewhere in there is black body radiation? No, I'm saying you're not getting black body. The black body has been mostly blanked out by the moon. So you're only getting right, so, but some black body radiation. And that's well, what... that's that. I mean, that's that's the the, the small amount of stuff in here. Um, you're also getting. I forget which of these lines. Maybe this one. You're also getting helium, um, which was discovered in the sun, in this kind of a spectrum, uh, because being a, an inert gas, it had not been studied in ground based chemistry labs. They had no spectrum of it. When they took the first flash spectra, they had these lines which they couldn't identify. And they called it helium after Helios, the sun, because they thought it was an element that only existed on the sun, just because it hadn't been identified and isolated on Earth. So that's one of the physics chemistry discoveries that was made by observing eclipses. Because they didn't have color film then, so they didn't have a pretty picture. Okay, and then you get to the main event, which is um, totality. And you're not going to see it like this. Uh, <laughs> this is a composite of 70 images, which were adjusted to get high dynamic range. But uh, your eye is a good high dynamic range instrument, so you will get a lot of the same effects. And um, what you're seeing here, and I don't know what the predictions are for 2024, but what you're seeing is in particular, this brush pattern at the Northern and Southern, Southern hemispheres, which is um, solar atmosphere corona following magnetic field lines coming out of the North and South. And then you're seeing extensions in the more equatorial regions that follow 
uh, additional magnetic field lines. And they're sort of suggestive of loops coming all the way out and coming back, which is what happens with the magnetic field lines around the sun. Here, you just see them going out, but around here, you're seeing them tend to loop. The, the corona is much brighter at the inside than the outside. And it actually, in, when you're looking at the eclipse, the outside structure will just dissipate into the blue sky because the sky is not totally black during totality. Um, you'll also see naked eye prominences as shown here, and they'll be pink because they're hydrogen. Uh, and you know what you get just depends on how many prominences there are at that instant. And it'll change a little bit because as the moon is larger than the sun, you'll see prominences mainly on one side first, and then they'll sort of disappear and they'll appear on the other side later on during totality. Um, binoculars help. Uh, the sun is still only half a degree across, which is about this. It's the same size as the moon because it's being covered by the moon. So to put it in scale, um, this is not very big. And you can only see the level of detail, truly naked eye, that you would see on the moon naked eye. So binoculars help, telescopes help, uh, simply to magnify the kind of structures that are in here. Uh, at the same time, you want to have a wide field of view because you want to you want to pull in the entire impression at one time. So this particular picture, I believe the documentation said it was uh, about four degrees by two and a half degrees. Um, maybe it's a little bit less. So you want to have a field of view in any kind of an optical instrument that's at least a few lunar diameters across in order to get the full impression of what's going on. Uh, and then of course, the, the whole thing repeats in the other, in reverse order on the way out, exactly the same. Uh, during the partial phases, you can look for, um, you can look for sunspots, or if you have a solar telescope, you can look for prominences, but uh, you'll see the prominences without a solar narrow band telescope during totality. Uh, and in most cases, a solar telescope would be just one more thing to bring along. So um, it's not a high priority. Questions about that? Discussion about that? Uh, of the people who've seen totality before, what's your impression? What's your biggest impression of, of the visual experience? Mm -mm. Well. Anybody? Uh, a lot of people remark on the general atmosphere around the sun, uh, away from the sun, uh, which gets uh, lit uh, indirectly. Uh, and you can sort of, if you, if you let people know about it, they can notice that they can sort of see the black spot moving around you in the atmosphere. Right. Uh, and I'm... Um... I'm going to talk about that a little bit in the, in the next section. Um, this was just about your impressions of the sky. Um, the, the other the other part is that depending on your altitude, uh, your 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 mountain height, um, the sky will get to be able to easily show second magnitude stars, maybe third or fourth. If you're on a high mountain, uh, you can probably see fourth magnitude stars during totality. Uh, it may be a little bit distracted. In 2017, uh, the eclipse was very close to Regulus. And that's something else which you should plan to, um, to make note of before you go observing where the sun will be at that instant, uh, at, the, at the time of totality, where the planets will be. Almost always you can see Mercury uh, and sometimes Venus. Mercury is hard to see normally because it's so close to the sun. Well, it's easy to see when the moon blocks the sun. Uh, as long as it's not an inferior or superior conjunction, you should be able to see it. Okay. I'll toss out something about uh, the the last total eclipse I went to. Uh, I was able to just enjoy the visual experience more where the first one I was too busy taking pictures. So uh, second one, I kind of had the camera on the autopilot. 
but to me, the, the, one of the incredible things is this: there's this magnificent black hole in the middle of the sky with, with all this incredible color streaming away from it. And, and the, the variety of colors, I mean, it was just, it was like there was every color in the rainbow. It's not just the red and the yellow. I mean, you, you had all these different shades of blue and such. I mean, it's it just really a, a fantastic visual experience. And it's one of those things, you know, just a, a, a warning to people, if you haven't done this before, don't get so caught up in trying to take the pictures that you miss this incredible visual experience. Right. So, uh, my impression, can you hear me? Yes. Um, from two eclipses that I've experienced, a bit surprisingly, is how small it is. If you're looking for the pictures, for instance, that you've been showing, show this you know, beautiful detailed eclipse. And one thing that's missed is the fact that when the moon is, when the sun and the moon are fairly high in the sky, the angular subtend of both are relatively small compared to the entire scope of the sky. And so if you're looking for it, you don't, you, yes, you may see those details if you look carefully, but you're not looking for a big object in the sky because the sky is so large. And, and particularly if you're trying to direct an optical instrument towards it, uh, it's not as easy, at least I haven't found it as easy as one would think it would be because it's not a it's not a large object, really. I mean, it, the effects are dramatic in terms of the environment and the sky, but um, the actual image of the sun and the moon covering it is rather small. At least that was my experience when I've seen that. Yeah, that's it. It's, it's going to be um, the same kind of, of visual resolution that you get looking naked eye at the moon and you don't see the craters on the moons. You see maybe the rays, maybe Copernicus, um, but you don't see anything like the detail that's being shown here unless you have magnification. And, and one of the comments I have in, in one of the later slides is one of the reasons to use a tracking mount um, if you're gonna have any kind of magnification with your telescope is so that you pointed at the sun when totality happens. Otherwise, you'd be wasting a lot of time trying to find it. Uh, the good news is you can track it during the partial phases and make sure everything is pretty well lined up and then not worry about what you, uh, what you uh, will see when you look through the eyepiece during totality. Uh, and by the way, remember to take the filter off. Okay, let's go on a bit. So uh, Dan and others had a good segue into this issue of what you're going to see around yourself uh, in, in the neighborhood. Um, this is, uh, again, National Park Service actually had some good environmental photographs uh, showing uh, what an area looked like during the beginning of partial phases uh, at um, I think this was Oregon in 2017, and then what it looked like during totality. And here you can see the, um, the, the sun, and it's not very big, as Rich was saying. Uh, and you can actually see the sky is still bright at the horizon because uh, you may well be within uh, a distance where you can see things that are still in sunlight. So, um, yeah, it's, and, and this whole thing is much darker. It's, you can't get the effect. The, the, the surroundings, well, there'll be a video coming up. The surroundings are getting like a factor of a million dimmer. Uh, the brightness directly around you is less than the brightness of a full moon. And the dis distant, you know, the difference between the sun and the moon is uh, 14 magnitudes. So that's, that's a factor of almost a million. 
and um, this is fainter than the full moon. So the ambient illumination is going down within a factor of, an, within a period of an hour by a factor of more than a million. And um, that's quite stunning. And that, that leads to some of the um, strange feelings you get and, and the effect on, on uh, the animals around you. I've noticed a lot of people, uh, it, it's fairly easy to see just before first contact uh, that the part of the sky that the shadow is approaching you from is very different from a from a regular daytime sky. Yeah, in the in, in the 1970 eclipse, I was at um, I was at 11,000 feet with a clear view of the valley, and we could see it. It was that was quite impressive. Now this is a this should be a video. I hope. That was also taken uh, in 2017. That's a time lapse of what happened to the scenery around uh, totality. And as I said, this is about two hours sped up. And the video didn't compensate for the brightness because your eye will compensate to some extent. but it is a relatively fast change. And especially the last few minutes before totality and the few minutes after totality, the rate of change of brightness is, is quite impressive. Now, there are a couple of things. Uh, what happened here? Yeah, I was gonna say, Alan, I, I don't, this thing about noticing, maybe I just didn't notice it before, but to me, it did, there was no difference in the, ambient light level until totality and it was like a step change and then a step change back to being bright that was my experience yeah so, the the last the last crescent because part of it is the geometry that the moon is leaving a crescent until the last instant and then wham um right. I've, I've seen plots of of how rapidly the change is but when at first contact, when it first starts covering the sun, as time goes on, it's the, the amount of the rate of increase is very, very slow and imperceptible to the eye because you're fully adjusting to it. But the last 30 yeah. seconds, I'd say you're it's you're like not that. immediately you're not adapting and you see the light go out. Right. And that's right. something which which you don't experience. It's not the same as sunset. Where the light is continuously decreasing relatively slowly. As the sun approaches the horizon, it's getting attenuated, it's getting darker, you don't notice it. Even when the sun's below the horizon, it's still light. But when the moon covers the sun, the light is cut off, except the stuff that's hitting around you, um, 40, 50, 60 kilometers away. Okay. I think I'm one way of thinking about it is uh, the nonlinearity in that uh, the difference between two headlights and one headlight is not nearly as much as one headlight and no headlights. Well, yeah, the whole business of, of logarithmic perception of brightness is is part of it, but it's the rate of change is, is the major thing. Now, one of the phenomena that uh, one of several phenomena visible on the ground near you is a thing called shadow bands. Um, shadow bands, the best description I have for it, it's like what's called caustics. Um, when, you, when you look at the bottom of a pool and you've got turbulence, you've got waves on the surface, the way that the light forms on the bottom gives the appearance of lines and those lines shimmer and move with the waves. And that is a very close analogy to what's happening in the atmosphere. Um, and it's the normal atmosphere that's causing scintillation and twinkling of stars. The, uh, in, the in the transition between the troposphere and the stratosphere, uh, there's a turbulent layer that causes the light to be relatively focused and defocused. The difference 
at an eclipse just before totality is that the turbulent layer is being illuminated by the crescent of the sun, which acts a lot like a slit. So it has a preferred directionality. And now the motion, the, the analogy of the motion of the focused light on the bottom of the pool now has a preferred direction lined up parallel to the crescent. And the result is a structure uh, on, on uniform surfaces, which you can see as shadow bands. Uh, the picture on the left is one of the first drawings of it. The coloring was added later. Um, it was observed in the 1600s and the 1700s as just one of the myster mysteries of solar eclipses when people saw them. Uh, the pictures on the left were taken by uh, an expedition from the University of Vienna. Uh, this was 2006 in Egypt, uh, where they set up specifically weather instrumentation and uniform white surfaces pointing perpendicular to the sun. Um, that shows in the upper picture and lower picture. They, they took some photographs and they stretched the contrast very strongly to show the effect. And, and they did a, a, a quantitative study of the direction and speed of shadow bands. And I believe those kinds of studies have shown that the shadow band phenomenology is actually consistent with twinkling in effect. Um, and if you, in effect, if you put your eye where the screen was, you would see a twinkling of the crescent as it got very, very narrow. And of course, that's what you'd expect. Uh, the atmosphere is being heated and cooled and uh, there's turbulence and it's non-uniform and the twinkling would get sort of bad. Um, and, and that's what you can expect to see during an eclipse. Now, the sun is much larger than a star, so it's not going to be nearly as obnoxious as twinkling of a star, but it's still going to be there. Uh, equipment for observing. This is the, the other topic for tonight, pretty much. So first of all, um, we've talked before, and everybody's talking about it, and I think everybody in this audience knows, uh, you need solar filter material, which attenuates the brightness of the sun by a factor of about uh, 100,000 or a million to one, that's 10 to the five or 10 to the six, or uh, otherwise called neutral density five, neutral density six. And uh, almost always now that's, uh, that's a thin film of plastic um, in the form of glasses. I have mine from the transit of Venus in 2004. I haven't worn them out yet. Um, and those those obviously hook on your hook on your ear. Uh, some people are like cards, which have the same kind of plastic material in a rigid frame, and you just hold it up in front of your face. Sometimes that's more convenient if you're wearing glasses. Um, and that way you only need to hold it in front of your eye when you're looking at the sun. That works just as well. The um, when you when you're looking with your naked eye at the progress of the eclipse, the optical quality, of course, doesn't matter too much. You're just seeing how much of the sun's covered. Uh, you can use sun projectors, which are better for groups looking at the eclipse. Um, I put one reference in here to uh, to a NASA site in 2017 that uh, showed both techniques for direct projection. Uh, you can do it with just a pinhole onto a, onto a white surface. Uh, you can do it using a telescope, but not a large telescope because uh, if you use eyepiece projection, you're concentrating the sunlight onto an eyepiece. And um, if you have more than about a two inch aperture, you stand the chance of damaging the eyepiece because of the concentrated sunlight. So, uh, that reference has examples. And one of the projection techniques, the eyepiece projection, they call the funnel uh, display where you take basically an oil funnel that you buy in, a, in an, automotive, an automotive store 
and cut it and put a um, a translucent screen on the open end and um, strap the narrow end to the circumference of an eyepiece and project the sun onto the translucent screen that way. That's fairly easy if the telescope if you have a telescope that's uh, robust enough to take the weight. As far as telescopes for observing, usually an issue is portability because you're traveling someplace to see the eclipse. Um, light gathering is not so important because um, it's not as important as low scatter, I'd say. Uh, because of the high dynamic range in what you're looking at, uh, at the sun during totality, the inner corona is very bright. The outer corona is very dim. And just like any kind of optics, you'd like it to be very clean so you're not scattering the bright part of the scene into the dim part of the scene. Field of view is important, um, especially if you want to see the outer structure. Uh, and um, that tends to mean that Binoculars tend to work pretty well. Uh, they'll tend to have the, the field of view and they're easy to point and they're easy to transport. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's nice if you have a telescope to set up the tracking uh, in, 20, in 2017. I, I did the polar alignment the night before and left things set up so that I had pretty good confidence that if I was pointing at the sun at the beginning of the partial phase, that I'd still be pointing pretty close to the sun when we got to totality, and that worked out nicely. So I didn't, one less thing to fumble with if you have a telescope. Uh, you'll need probably a filter for either binos, uh, binoculars, or for your telescope. Uh, I would say that optical quality is not as important. You don't, you're, you're not there looking for sunspots you're just looking to attenuate the the bright disk of the sun so you can watch the progress as soon as you get very close to totality when you start getting the diamond ring you're going to take that filter off and uh, secondarily the important thing is that you're able to get it off quickly you don't want to be futzing around with uh, a bunch of set screws or or tape or things that are holding it on too robustly um, and in particular, you don't want to be having to pull the filter off so tightly that you so with so much energy that you end up uh, mispointing the telescope from the from the sun. So it's got to stay on so you're safe, but it's got to come off easy. And I'd also say, and if you lose it during totality, no big deal. Uh, you, you've seen the good stuff. Um, of course, with an well, annual what are some eclipse, recommendations for that? Because I've looked at the solar filters that you can buy for binoculars, and frankly, they scare me. I'm, you know, I'm concerned about them coming off when I'm looking through at the sun. Well, when you're looking at the sun, you're looking up. So it's it's with and and this picture here shows a, a homemade DIY binocular filter, which was done cutting off some kind of a plastic tube end and fitting it over the, the binocular. And um, there was a more extensive DIY article, but basically taping the filter material to the tube end and lining the, uh, lining the tube with a foam tape, not double stick foam tape, but just single stick foam tape to give the inner side of the the plastic a tight fit around the binoculars. friction fit yeah but it was a friction fit not a taped fit not a glued fit and um it cutting a hole in the in the working end of the tube oops um kept it flat enough the the optical quality of the film depends on its its uniform thickness, not its flatness. And the um, the high quality films you can buy are flat enough. So even if it's curved, when you do your DIY attachment, 
that will not in any noticeable way deteriorate from the quality of the image. I yeah, wouldn't I've need... wondered I've wondered about using velcro like putting a strip of velcro with adhesive around the barrel and then also putting the opposite side of velcro on the inside of something that would basically not go but vel velcro velcro you have to pull off so you can't you can't it has sheer strength you can't slide it off it's going to no, pull no. off yeah if this would not be a slide it would be a like a flat thing that would come up like that yeah i I'd, I'd say make a tab of it that latch it, that that laps over the edge of the filter holder on the outside so you can pull it off Alan, right. Greg is showing his here. Yeah, I wanted to see what Greg had too. Um, so, so this is a very cheap uh, set of ten by fifties, I think. Let's see what it says. Yeah, ten by fifties that came with solar filters that have a little screw, like here, that you use and you just pull off. And it actually buries itself into the uh, this plastic cover here, and it's very secure. Uh, it's it's not high quality, but it's very inexpensive. And then to expose the filters, you want to protect those so you don't break them. Then it's got this little cover on each of them that come off. That's one version. Uh, I actually gave that to my brother who was in Salt Lake City. Uh, and I used these, which were uh, six by, I think they're six by 30, six by 30 lunts. Uh, and they're specific um, with, with uh, permanent uh, filters in them. And I just used them uh, while the uh, telescope was recording all the action. I just used them to sort of keep track of where we were and to you know get some visual excitement for watching the uh the partial eclipse phase uh but what i found at the time was both uh were very inexpensive surprisingly the uh 10 by 50s were the cheapest i think they were like 40 40 dollars something like that from b and h and then the lunts which I also bought from B&H, but I, I can't seem to find them now, were more like about $60, $60. But they were both were just great. And uh, uh, rather than screw up a pair of nice um, Leica uh, binoculars, I just threw these in with my stuff and took them with me, and they served the purpose and were very inexpensive. And I still got them and I'm going to use them again. <laughs> what, what I did, um, because I wasn't bringing, uh, I, I didn't want to bring big binoculars. I was already weight limited on, on the flight. Um, I brought, I think there were six by 20s. And literally what I did was I cut the filter material and cut slots, radial slots in a circular piece of filter material and folded it down around the binocular end piece and taped it so it was tight. And it was ugly as anything and worked perfectly fine. And since I had folded it down and taped it uh, around so it was friction fit to those particular binoculars, they held on very well. And I still have those too. Uh, as I said, it was ugly. It did distort the film material but not in a way that made any difference. So, um, and, the, and then I had nice compact binoculars to use just for looking around nature watching while I was there. I'm gonna have to leave in a few moments, but yep. uh, uh, talking about improvised uh, watchers, watching devices, uh, you might, uh, I, you, I discovered something recently in the, I guess, three years ago. Uh, I was uh, presenting uh, down at the community center and uh, had the uh, cook come out <clears throat> with a kitchen colander and a, a soup spoon, uh, one of those things with the little holes, a spoon with the holes in it. 
And both of those make excellent, safe, impromptu uh, uh, solar telescopes. I discovered that if you moved the colander or the spoon uh, in front of one of the in front of the other, uh, it gave a very remarkable uh, scintillation effect on the ground. <clears throat> I mean, it was quite surprised. I mean, people were quite surprised to see the crescents forming from the dots, which they expected to see as the eclipse st uh, started. But I had never seen the effect, uh, this effect that uh, I've. Yeah, I, I've got a video coming up that, that shows, I think it shows a colander trick. Um, as long as you have a colander with uh, circular drain holes. Um, a lot of them have slats now. But yes, that works too, um, for especially for seeing the crescents during the partial phase. You can show, and kids love it. Um, uh, but the remarkable thing that I found, I discovered was that if you put the spoon in front of the colander so that the sun shines through both and moves them with respect to one another, uh, it uh, provides a very remarkable and sort of un indescribable scintillation effect. Yeah. And I'd like to see somebody describe that. I've not found anything so far that describes well, that effect. Look up Moiré, M-O-I-R-E. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem to be quite that, though. I mean, I know well, what Moiré is. Circular, it's circular, but yeah, it's it's... It's a well-known, it's a well-known phenomenon that you can, the spacing is uneven, so it's, uh, turns on and off. Okay, let me, let me continue. I think uh, we've covered that. Um, site selection, we actually talked about in some previous sessions, it's pretty much for visible, uh, is the same as everything else. Um, if you're, if you're visible only, you may be more mobile and more willing to get up and move to accommodate the weather so possibly access to road network would be more important to you if you've if you've brought a lot of photo equipment you may be pretty well um, um locked in one place i see a typo it's not rods and plans so roads and plans are are important um weather of course is is dominant uh once once you're in the region of the of the uh, central path, uh, you want to have a place that's uh, clear weather. It may be more important to uh, to have a high elevation for the sun. I don't know for visible for visible use uh, for visible applications where you really want the sky to be dark, so you get naked eye contrast. You don't want the sun to be uh, the eclipsed sun to be low in the sky. A camera might be able to pull that out better, but your eye can't. Um, duration, ground elevation, again, for dark skies and um, uh, and, and transparency. Uh, now, sky pollution isn't a problem because the area around the path will still be in sunlight, as I said. There'll be a lot of light coming from uh, the area that is not in totality. You don't want, as people have commented, you don't want parking lot lights or similar things shining directly into your into your eyes or into your telescope. Um, so you don't want direct light pollution, like trespass, but you don't have to worry about being close to a city as much because um, that won't dominate your limitations. Um, closing thought, don't get so wrapped up in the details that you don't see the eclipse. That's, that's what everyone who's seen eclipses tells everybody else. Don't try to take a whole bunch of photographs that you're operating the camera and looking through the eyepiece, uh, looking through the viewfinder of the camera, look through something that gives you a good view of the eclipse, first of all, and enjoy the surroundings. Now, I've got a, I hope this shows, uh, a, a JPL movie that was done up for uh, 2017 that summarizes a lot of this, and I hope the sound comes out. Let's see if that works. Are you seeing it? 
August 21st, yes. total solar eclipse traces a narrow path across the nation, though most of the U.S. will see a partial eclipse. Thank you very much, Alan. I've uh, got to get going. Bye-bye. from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Not everyone can travel to the narrow path of totality, so here are some things to look for no matter whether you see totality or a partial eclipse. Before Eclipse Day, pack your Eclipse toolkit with a notebook, pen or pencil, a clock, a stopwatch, the front page of a newspaper, a thermometer, and a stick with a piece of crepe paper tied to it, and bring an assistant to help conduct some science observations. Practice using a citizen science phone app to help you study clouds, air, and surface temperatures during the eclipse. A good one is the GLOBE app. Go to the location where you'll view the eclipse and check for trees and buildings that may obstruct your view. Totality lasts less than three minutes, so you may want to focus on doing only one science observation or just really experience the eclipse. Don't waste this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity by watching it on your phone screen. Plan to have your safe solar viewing glasses within immediate reach in your pocket or around your neck for quick eye protection before and after totality. Just before totality, if you have a good view of the horizon, look west for the approaching shadow. After totality, look east, low on the horizon for the departing shadow. If it's cloudy, try to see the shadow by looking up at the bottoms of the clouds. During totality, look for stars. Can you see Regulus in the solar corona, the stars of Orion? How early and how late is Venus visible? Can you see any other planets? Before and after totality, you may see moving waves of light and shadow, like the patterns you see on the bottom of a swimming pool. How dark does it get at totality? As it gets darker, look at the newspaper you brought and see what's the smallest print you can read. How much does the temperature drop during totality? Does the wind start, stop, or change direction? Watch and listen for changes in animal and bird behavior. During the partial phases, use your hands as a pinhole projector. You'll be able to see the crescent shape of the sun projected through the spaces created by your fingers. You can also make a paper pinhole projector. In fact, any item with one or more holes in it, like a kitchen colander, a loosely woven straw hat, even leaves on trees, will project the crescent shapes. You can find out about all of NASA's missions at www.nasa.gov. And you can find out more about the eclipse, including eclipse safety, at eclipse2017.nasa.gov. That's all for this month. I'm Jane Houston Jones. So that was pretty good at tying it all together and trying to encourage, especially students, to do a little bit of experimentation. Uh, they haven't done a similar one for 2024 yet. I hope they do. Uh, it would be useful. So I think that's all I have for tonight. Um, anybody else have any additional comments? and thoughts on, on what they've done in the past? Um, Alan, I'll just mention that uh, I'm a just a general photographer as well. And I happen to go over my collection of uh, photographs that I keep online. And I noticed, I had forgotten this, that I had uh, made and kept a copy of a about a five minute video from two and a half minutes before totality through totality to the end of totality where I just set up a point and shoot camera and turned on the video on a little uh, a tripod and just left it alone and let it run. And everything everyone says is true. It, the darkness comes in there at the last minute, everyone gets excited and starts screaming. And, uh, and then uh, the light comes back and 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 it uh, passes just as quickly as it came. It's a, but it's a very exciting event. Yeah, um, the um, one one of the videos was supposed to have a soundtrack of uh, of the people in the surroundings, but uh, that didn't come through, so I didn't I didn't include it. But there's a lot of oohs and eyes, and it's nice to observe with people around. So you get that. Um, and 
even uh, even the people who don't think they're going to be excited tend to be, and uh, it makes it fun uh, because it's so different. It's it's such a different experience. I, I will say uh, uh, the last eclipse. One of the fun things I did was I I put an old video camera. It was one of the old camcorders we'd use for years, out of date and all that. I put it up in a tree and just pointed it at the people. And I started at 15 minutes before totality. And then later, you know, we have all these images and all that, but but just watching the reactions of people. And of course, during totality, the camp, but it's still the, the soundtrack was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's my reaction too. When the, um, the last eclipse, they, there weren't too many people around, but I was with about a dozen people and it was, and they were all serious about watching it. Um, so, hey, yeah, Alan. visible is good. Howdy. Alan, uh, this is Richard Grohl. Can you hear yes. me? Yes. Okay. Hey, um, the last time, the, before the eclipse, there were a lot of uh, presentations that were available from different places. And I just put one together. I'm a volunteer at the library and they asked me to do a presentation. It was a full house. I'd never gotten up and given a presentation, but I put together one and I've just urged people to take advantage of this opportunity because there are a lot of libraries. The libraries are on board. My library had free viewing glasses for everybody that came to the presentation. They, they did this in advance. They had thousands of them for, for the county library system. So look for a, for a chance to, to share it in this way and, and don't be afraid. Yeah, um, and we talked, I think, at the at the first session about maybe maybe Novak could do something about getting glasses and distributing them at our outreach events. Um, and um, I think Dan's doing some of that, um, looking for uh, a, a partner, a funding partner for it. Uh, in bulk, the Eclipse glasses are not very expensive, and. I think Novak has people who could do outreach at places like at uh, like libraries, and even as part of our Sky Meadow outreach, just all the people who come through that. If we made sure we passed out glasses to them uh, for this fall for the annual eclipse, which will be partial here. Yes, uh, LME, the glasses. Sorry, the glasses are an incentive. And the library was giving them out before, you know, a month or so before, where there was so much demand, they shut it off and they they held it for, if you want the glasses, you come to the presentation, but all the libraries are interested in having talks on the equips. So right. just go to your local library and, and ask them or talk to them when the time comes. I would like to throw out on that, that uh, there were some really good presentations made in 2017, including some at Almost Heaven Star Party and at uh, Star Astronomy Day. You know. uh, in particular, the presentation made by Mike Reynolds, he's written several books uh, on the topic and all. And so if you look in the, the uh, Novak YouTube uh, library, uh, all those great presentations are still there. And, and what Reynolds was talking about on uh, eclipses is still relevant. Some of the other stuff, like I did one on uh, eclipse photography. Uh, we're talking about 35, well, we were talking about DSLRs back then. I think everybody's mostly going to be using smartphones today. So a lot of what I talked about in photography is not as useful, but but Mike Ronald's presentation is is really awesome. Yeah, um, I, I haven't seen any information about how to well, we should talk about this when we talk about astrophotography, but how to use smartphones to take a, eclipse pictures. Uh, the, in normal mode, the sun would be very, very small. And I know there are clip-on uh, telephoto ad, uh, adapters. I don't know if yep. those are any good, and I don't know if people are going to experiment with those 
to see uh, the best way to use them for solar eclipses and whether or not the auto exposure functions in smartphones will adapt properly. Uh, it'll give you something clearly, but um, whether it's any good or not, clearly people will try. Uh, it might be good to just warn them to get something to hold the camera so they're not trying to both look at the camera and look at the sun and get it pointed right. Because uh, even if they put it on a cheap tripod with an adapter, they'd be better off. And maybe those are some things that Novak people could try to experiment with to get better. And as Dan and others have pointed out, to some extent, the annual eclipse will be a, a test case uh, for experimenting with, with equipment and making sure things run right. Um, but uh, what stymied us with um, the eclipse glasses for getting Novak getting them and helping libraries with distribution is we we don't have anybody who stepped up to to do it for the club specifically. Uh, we got lots of good ideas and not much execution. So yeah, we'll um, Alan, they're inexpensive. You can just sell them for a buck. You know. And people are willing, well, they get excited yeah, I know. That's, you know, to do that. You know, that, and that was the plan. We could we could sell them to the people who can pay for a buck and we can give them, give them out to school kids. We don't have to charge. Yep. But um, who who's the you and you can um, is always the problem. Somebody can, but I don't have the name to put in for somebody. So. You know. Wait a minute. Um, Novak has has a big bank account. What's the problem here? Not the money. Need somebody okay. to do it. We need somebody to order them. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> somebody to order oh, them. Oh, I get somebody it. Somebody to control, you know, to keep track of them. Somebody to talk oh. to the libraries. Uh, you know, all, all those things. None of which individually takes much time. But it's a project for someone. And um, as I said, Dan's doing one part of it. But... Um, Oh yeah, the, the money is not the issue. They're cheap. It. It, it's a but good job. There's a, long, there's a lead members. time too. If we don't do it now, we're yeah. not going to have it for August. Yeah. Because we're not the only ones who have noticed that there's an eclipse coming. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so <clears throat> good. <laughs> uh, like that. anyway, we're not going to solve that now, I guess, unless yep. uh, somebody raises their hand. Okay. I appreciate everybody's attention. It's uh, yeah, it's a an, an hour and a quarter now, so maybe we'll wrap this up unless somebody has any final comments. But uh, I appreciate. Alan, when, when's our next session? Uh, it'll be around the next full moon. I think was the intent, and on a, and I on a Tuesday, we said we'd alternate Tuesdays and Thursdays, and um, I think that'd probably be about three weeks. Um, and what I'd like to do is talk about astrophotography. And um, I really would need somebody to, to help make a presentation with an experience. Uh, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll bend Greg's arm or Dan or somebody else. I can contribute some things, but uh, one of the biggest problems in astrophotography for solar eclipses is not many people have more than about 20 minutes experience <laughs> yeah. and, and, yeah. and I, you know, I, I have I, 20, 20 minutes experience once. Yeah. <laughs> that was about it. Yeah, but now, uh, and um, you know, so so there are lessons learned, and there there are many negative lessons learned. Uh, and luckily, it's getting a little bit easier with the um, with the orchestrators and with the digital cameras where. The, the exposures are better, well, uh, are more well defined. So you know what you should be able to, um, to set for exposure times. You can look those things up in some reference books. And, Alan, uh, there's a guy named Shane Mostel from Australia, and he has a blog on uh, astrophotography. Yeah, yeah. Let me look up in his library and see if he has done this. Uh, he's really an excellent presenter and very thorough. And I would not be surprised if he, 
if anybody out there, that would be him. Do you know him, Shane? Yeah, I've been, I, I've I've been following him. He's, he's really good. And one thing I will say is, you know, Australia's got their total eclipse next month. So Lucky. we should be able to get a lot of lessons learned from, right. uh, from right. those guys. Good. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But it's Shane's like, very good. Yeah. I, I'll, I will say, well, it's anticipating next week. Getting clean optics is really important. Um, I, I, I missed last time by having an inexpensive telescope, not a bad one. Mm -hmm. uh, I got the focal length right. I got, I got it matched to the, tele, to the camera <laughs> correct. But mm -hmm. um, you need really clean optics and all the good procedures, flats and darks. And, um, uh, and then you have the high dynamic range processing. Uh, you think you can spend a lot of time doing planetary nebulae. You can spend years post-processing your solar eclipse pictures <laughs> as you try to do HDR on 10 or 15 exposures and, and combining them creatively. Okay, I think it's time to wrap up and I appreciate everybody's attention. Thank you all for coming. I'll send out a notice when uh, when I figure out really what, what the date will be. Is it? But I said about three weeks, I think, would be around uh, full moon, beginning of uh, April. Okay, everybody. See you Thank next you, time. Alan. Good job. Yeah, Thank, Thank you, Alan. Alan.